Hey, welcome to another edition of Fiends and Screams. Um, in case you missed the first two episodes, my name's Lou Yardley and I'm an indie horror author from the UK. Uh, these podcasts are just a way for me to read you my short stories and also read you like little sneak peeks for my four-length novels as well. And today is going to be one of those days where I will be reading a bit from a four-length novel. Um, in June of this year, I, I went to the Brighton & Hove Book Fair where I did a, my very first reading, which I practiced a lot for. Um, I was really, really nervous, but I think it went quite well. So today I'm going to read you that passage that I read at the Brighton and Hove Book Fair. Um, it's from it's from my book Hellhound, which I released in 2018. Um, lots of people seem to like it, which is really, really cool. If you do want to check the book out after this, it's available on Amazon, Kobo, iTunes, all those kind of things, but you can also get it from my online shop at louyardley.bigcartel.com. I'm going to try and put some links in the description of this podcast on YouTube and Vimeo. Um, I had a bit of trouble putting a long description on Podbeam, but I'll do what I can. Before I dive into that, I just wanted to tell you about a little bit of fundraising I'm doing at the moment. Um, as you might know if you follow me on Twitter or Facebook, my lovely little nephew Max sadly passed away at the beginning of August on the 11th. Um, he'd had a pretty um, intense battle with cancer and the folks at Great Ormond Street Hospital have been really really amazing to him and they gave us an extra six months with him that we wouldn't have had otherwise. So um, in his memory as a way to honour honor his memory, I'm going to be running my very first 5k in October. Um, up until this point, I haven't really run since PE at school. <laughs> and maybe the odd bus here and there. But even then, if I see a... Well, up until this point, if I saw a bus waiting at the bus stop and I wasn't going to get to it, I'd just let it go. Wait for the next one. They're like every 10 minutes. Anyway, so yeah, if you want to sponsor us, just go to justgiven.com slash fundraising slash team hyphen max 2019 and that's us um yeah i'd appreciate any donation no matter how big or small or if you haven't got any money if you could share the link i'd really appreciate that too cool so if you're sitting comfortably then i shall begin hellhound chapter five the comfortable bed embraced her but Christine couldn't sleep too long or too deeply. Exhausting all her usual tricks, one foot out beneath the blanket, fan on, window open, sheep counted, she got up and walked to the window. Outside, despite the late hour, there were still people milling around, in various states of intoxication, doing whatever people do in the very early hours of the morning. At the point where tomorrow turns into today. Aside from the old shout or lone car horn, the night was peaceful. The outside providing no reason why she shouldn't be able to sleep. Those reasons hid inside her head. Her mind just couldn't let go of the events of the last few hours. The scream, real or imagined, weighed heavily on her mind anchoring her in wakefulness. Going back to bed would be pointless, so Christine turned to check the clock radio on a nightstand to see if it was a reasonable time to make coffee and start on breakfast. Darkness stood in the place where red digits usually waited. Hmm, that's odd, she thought. Must be a power cut or something. Bare feet paced across the room and she tried the light switch. It didn't work. No change, not even a flicker, happened after she clicked it on and off again half a dozen times. Maybe a fuse has blown, she thought. Glad to have something to do, Christine crossed back to her nightstand, opened the drawer and pulled out a torch. A big, heavy thing that took a seemingly infinite supply of those huge batteries. Sometimes she thought about replacing it with something more compact. But she liked the idea of having it close to her at night. Christine lived alone. 
and she thought the torch might prove itself to be a useful weapon if anyone chose to break in. Not that it could do much damage, but a decent swing to the head with enough force behind it might slow any wannabe attacker, enough for her to make a hasty escape. The space in front of her immediately illuminated as she hit the power switch. Christine couldn't remember when she'd last replaced the batteries, but the light held bright and strong. As she swung the light around her bedroom, she wondered if any passers-by would mistake her for a burglar. She dismissed the thought almost as soon as it had formed. Of course no one would. Nobody would be remotely interested. You could be bleeding from every orifice and screaming like someone insisted on inserting a very large, very sharp metal pole up your rectum. Nobody would even bat an eyelid. Everyone here was just too involved in their own business. In many ways, this was one of the things that Christine liked about her current location. She had anonymity here. It also nagged at her. What if the hypothetical attacker did break in? She'd be on her own. The big torch filled the role of being her first and last lines of defence. With the torch tightly gripped in her left hand, Christine carefully made her way downstairs. The fuse box was just by the front door, almost directly in front of the staircase. She'd look inside, and with a quick flick of the switch, there would be light and radio alarm clocks. Her hand touched the door of the fuse box, but before she could open it, she noticed something amiss. It felt like she was being watched. Her heart quickened in her chest. Was this it? Was the hypothetical attacker real? Thinking nonchalant, she slowly turned around. A face stared back at her. The whites of its eyes wild. It took Christine a long moment to realise she was looking at her own reflection in the mirror on the wall. She smiled, even though part of her thought that the reflection wouldn't do the same. There was nothing unusual here. Her reflection only looked sinister due to the dark shadows caused by torchlight. Nothing to worry about. There were no ghoulish apparitions in this house. Everything was fine. That's what she told herself. But that feeling of unseen eyes studying her remained, making her skin prickle. Frantically, she looked around, trying to take in every bit of her surroundings. She knew this house. She'd lived here for seven years, so she could account for every shape and every shadow. Maybe I'm just shaken because of what happened at the pub, she thought, reasoning with herself. She turned back to the fuse box. Knock. 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 The knocking was quiet, but intentional. It didn't need to be loud. She was standing right next to the door. Whoever stood on the other side waited just a few inches away, separated by a lump of wood. Christine hoped it was a very strong, very secure lump of wood. If she concentrated, she could hear breathing. Ragged, feral breathing. More animal than human. This is stupid, she thought but it didn't stop her from tightening her grip on the torch even more. Cramp threatened to take her hand hostage. Knuckles whitened with the effort. For a moment, Christine couldn't move. She wanted to flick the switch in the fuse box, and she wanted to check the peephole, but she did neither of those things. At that time, those things were impossible. Christine stood, perfectly still, feeling like any movement would betray her, and tried to remember how to breathe. She'd been breathing for years, surviving perfectly independently. Why couldn't she do it now? Finally, she convinced herself to move. Slowly, carefully, and as quietly as possible, she moved towards the door. Her hands touched the wood panelling, and her face closed in on the peephole. The little round hole revealed the world outside. There was nobody there. 
I'm imagining things. I must be sleep deprived. After she had examined the view for the peephole for a little while longer, her eyes persuaded her that nobody had come to visit. Almost. Christine may have been sleep deprived, and she may have been paranoid. But what was the saying? Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you. After having confirmed that there was nobody outside her front door, Christine decided to return to her original task. She aimed the torch back at the fuse box and stepped back over to it. She took one step, then another. Then the torch died. Darkness swallowed Christine. A feeling of panic started to grow inside her. Starting in the pit of her stomach, it forced its way up into her throat. Asphyxia wrapped its claws around her. She took deep breaths, trying to calm herself. This was stupid. A grown woman shouldn't be afraid of the dark. Besides, she could work out which switch needed flicking by touch. She'd be basking in artificial light in no time at all. Her left hand refused to let go of the torch. The thought of the hypothetical attacker still firmly lodged in her mind. So she used her right hand to feel its way around the outside of the fuse box. Soon enough, she found the small handle and opened the box. The small door emitted a high-pitched squeak as it opened, making Christine cringe. If an intruder stalked around the house, they would have heard that. Still, she needed to open that little door. It was the only way she was going to get any light. Once again, her hand reached forward, aiming for the area where she thought the rows of switches started. Then she paused. What if there was something in the fuse box? What if her hand plunged into a massive spider web? What if a creature with thousands of legs now reached out for her hand as her hand reached for the switches? Christine swallowed, trying to force the revulsion that she felt back inside. She was being irrational. Christine reached out, pushing the thought of touchy, fearly little creatures from her mind. Slowly, her hand closed the distance. Her fingertip touched the corner of the first switch, and then moved on to the next. No critters touched her, and nothing bit her. Christine methodically continued with her task. She allowed herself to calm down and breathe more easily. She was fine. Everything was fine. Knock. Christine's heart nearly leapt out of her chest. Knock. She turned her head towards the door. Anger replaced terror, finally pushing it out of the way. An idiot teenager probably waited on the other side, thoroughly enjoying their idea of a joke. Knock. Stopping her task once again, Christine almost threw herself towards the door. She peered through the peephole expecting to see nothing, or at very least, the sight of someone running away, laughing at her expense. Neither of those visions met her eye. Outside stood a man wearing a dark suit and sunglasses at night. He stood there with an air of authority. His demeanor didn't suggest that he was involved in a prank and his stance certainly wasn't that of a drunk. Christine felt compelled to open the door, but she held back. Who the hell was he? And why the hell was he here? Christine, the man said softly, but loud enough for her to hear on the other side of the door. I know you're there. Christine held her breath and continued to watch. I just want to talk to you. I have something important to say. The man's words were met with silence and stillness. It's about the Hound and the Philosopher Inn. This got Christine's attention. What about it? Her quiet voice must have been muffled through the door, but the man appeared to hear it perfectly. Open the door and I'll tell you. Christine knew that no matter what, she shouldn't open the door. Keeping that door shut ensured her survival. Nothing about this situation felt safe. She lived in an area where nobody gave two shits about their neighbours, in a house on her own, in the dark, with nothing but a dead torch for protection. 
All that was bad enough, even before you considered the strange man on the other side of the door. The man that Christine was now starting to think of as a creepy James Bond. There was no doubt about it. The rational side of her brain knew that she absolutely shouldn't even consider opening that door. The trouble was that the rational side of her brain was in complete disagreement with the curious side of her brain. This man might be able to give her answers. If she had answers, then maybe she could sleep. Christine opened the door and brandished the torch like a baseball bat, hoping that it would put creepy 007 off attacking her. Hello, Christine, he said, not at all bothered by Christine's choice of weapon. Christine noticed this and immediately found her torch woefully inadequate. Sorry to bother you at this hour. It's fine, she said. It wasn't. How could it be? Fantastic. I didn't want to disturb you. Um, you said you wanted to talk to me about the Hound and Philosopher Inn. Yes, the man said, taking a step forward. Christine immediately took a step back. You were there a few hours ago, weren't you? Christine nodded. I've been led to believe that you may have seen or heard some things that you weren't meant to, he said. We're going to need you to forget all about them. What things? You know what things. Who are we? You don't need to know. You just need to forget. Before Christine knew what was happening, the man had moved even closer and grabbed her arm, completely ignoring her weapon. His grip was strong, and Christine knew her arm would be bruised come morning. Stay away from the pub, he said. Do not mention it to anyone. Do you understand? Christine nodded. If you were to talk to anyone, and I do mean anyone, about what you think you've witnessed, things will end very badly for you. Do you understand? Christine nodded again. She had no doubt that some tragic end would befall her as she disobeyed this man. I know, the man said, smiling at having come to some kind of decision in his head. I'll give you a taste of what you can expect. Pay close attention now. No, please don't hurt me, Christine twisted in the man's grip, unable to escape. It was like he possessed a superhuman strength. I understand. I won't say a word. I promise. The man held his free hand in front of Christine's face. At first, she thought he intended to hit her. But when no hit came, she focused her attention onto the man's hand, unsure of what else to do. As she stared, the man's index finger started to stretch unnaturally. She could hear the bones inside it creak and crack and grow and alter their shape. Not only did the finger grow in length, but the knuckles widened and the skin turned grey. At the finger's tip, a talon-like claw began to form. The claw looked deadly and sharp as a knife. Christine screamed. Nobody seemed to notice. Nobody came to her rescue. With a nauseating slowness, the man guided his hand to her arm and plunged that deadly blade-like claw into her flesh. Blood pooled around it and dribbled along his hand. The man let go of Christine, but she stayed still, transfixed on the monster in front of her. While he knew that he had her undivided attention, the man licked her blood from his deformed finger. The man's predatory smile widened, making him even more sinister, making him look like a wolf. Thank you very much, that's all for today. Uh, if you want to find out what happens to Christine, then please check out the links below or go to louyardley.bigcartel.com or your favourite bookshop and ask for Hellhound by Lou Yardley. Thank you very much and I'll catch you next time. Um, in the meantime, be excellent to each other. Take care of yourselves. Blood, guts and hugs. Thank you. Bye.